This is the sermon for the 18th Sunday after Pentecost. Our gospel lesson is taken from the 22nd chapter of Matthew, beginning with the first verse. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This morning we have another familiar parable, or perhaps set of parables, told by Jesus. Now, if your Christian upbringing was anything like mine, you have at some point heard this parable taught in this way. The king, of course, is God. And the wedding feast, well, that's the invitation we have to the marriage feast of the Lamb. You know, going to heaven, or having Jesus as our Savior, or something like that. And those who were invited, well, perhaps those were God's original chosen people, the ones who rejected Jesus. And the rabble, the good, the bad, and the ugly, that ultimately did get invited when the first guests wouldn't attend, well, that's got to be the Gentiles, like us. Now let's see. The king destroying those who rejected the invitation, that would have to be the judgment. Those who reject Jesus get destroyed, go to hell when they die, or get cast into the lake of fire when the world ends. Okay, now the next part. The wedding feast itself, well, that would have to be heaven, or at least life with God. And the guy who didn't have the right kind of clothing, he must be the poor slob who tries to get right with God without confessing Jesus as his personal savior and relies on his own righteousness. So the king, God that is, it kicks him out. And everyone else, wearing the proper clothes, parties on. Now, I don't mean to be flippant. For many years, I heard this parable taught in about that way. Obviously, generally with more gravity, but that certainly was the gist. The king is God. God calls you. Those who don't go are in some form of eternal jeopardy. The only way to get in and stay in once you get to the gates is to have on the clean white garment provided for you. This morning, I'd like to challenge that interpretation. If you'd like to know why I am unsatisfied with the understanding that I grew up with, and I still generally hear whenever these stories are taught, well, frankly, what we might call the traditional interpretation is decidedly lacking in both logic and compassion. But before leaving that traditional interpretation totally, uh, let me suggest that it is 
not without some value. In fact, it's possible that no interpretation of any parable is valueless, because parables, after all, are intended, I believe, to tell us at least as much about ourselves as they tell us about God. We tend to read the parables from the top down, so to speak, because that's the way that society teaches us to view the world. What is important? Who is important? Society would have us ask. The king? A father? Authority figures? They are clearly important. So unless we are specifically told that it is an evil king or a bad father, we will probably want to associate authority figures with God as much as we will want to view ourselves as equated to whatever party comes out all right at the end of the story. Top-down readings tend to engender a picture of an authoritative God and a patriarchal kingdom, something that in fact looks a lot like the world in which we live, just hopefully better. This morning, I want to suggest a different vantage point, a bottom-to-top perspective, reading the parables from the bottom looking up, so to speak. Why? Any number of reasons, but for this morning and just for now, I wonder if we might stipulate to the fact that Jesus, in his life on earth, identified not with kings and rulers, nor with the wealthy, were those who were of little or no account. From stable birth to criminal's death, Jesus associated and was connected with the lowly. He blessed those whom the world had rendered powerless. So what then if we applied his perspective in life to his teachings? Now back to our traditional interpretation for a moment. The one I just said lacked logic and compassion. The king is throwing a party. A wedding banquet for his son, to be specific. But no one wants to show up. In fact, the invitees so don't want to show up that ultimately, after several invitations, they wind up killing the messengers. Now... It must have been some party, a party where one had to be convinced, even with death threats, to attend. And in response to this vehement lack of interest, the king destroys the cities of the invitees, killing everyone there. But is this the way God operates? Do this or I'll kill you? Now, sure, that's the way a lot of people imagine their God. Here are the commandments. Do them or else suffer and die. But is that a God you actually want to worship? Is that a God you can love? One who threatens and then kills, presumably the innocent along with the guilty. For this parable sounds a lot like what happens in a war. The opposing force overtakes the countryside and destroys the city. Along the way, not only enemy combatants are killed, but also civilians, women and children and the elderly, those who have nothing to do with the fight. Collateral damage, I believe we call that. There are those who say that God is like that. But I say that Jesus came expressly to teach us that God is not like that at all. God does not desire the death even of the wicked, nor does God take any delight in the death of the sinner. So if for a moment we can entertain the thought that God is not a murderer, that God does not rain down fire upon cities or invite people with death threats. Then we ask ourselves, what is the alternative? When we are speaking of the king, we're not talking about God, but in fact about human authority. 
For as human beings that invite each other at the point of a bayonet or at the wrong end of a gun, that as human beings that use the threat of killing the innocent along with the guilty as a means of mollifying adversaries, it is human authority that insists its subjects fall in line like so many sheep, human authority that draws the lines in the sand we call borders, and human authority that determines the price to be paid for stepping out of line and defying the will of whatever god-king we create for ourselves. While we are continuing along this line of thinking, it is also human authority that makes people interchangeable. Not a god who we presume to be compassionate. Those people don't want to attend, so destroy them and get some other people. In fact, invite them all and we'll sort them out later. And that brings us to the wedding feast itself. Now peopled, it seems, by new invitees, those who are made up of everyone, rich and poor, good and bad. And at first blush, that seems awfully inclusive, awfully good-natured, until we realize that there are, despite the generality of the invitation, certain stipulations, or at least one very important one. All the guests who wish to remain must wear the same type of garment. Their individuality must, it seems, be subjugated to the honor of the bridegroom. That, of course, is the reason for needing to wear the much-touted wedding garments, so that all the guests appear uniform, and no one overshadows any other, and more importantly, no one overshadows the important one. It doesn't matter who or what you are, so long as you put on the right outer covering. Again, something that seems a whole lot more like what the world does. God, it appears, creates in infinite variety, while the world tries to create uniformity. It is human beings, or more specifically, human civilization, that sets its own standards for behavior and appearance. Woe unto the person who shows up wearing the wrong outfit for the wrong occasion. So if then the king is in fact representative of the worldly authorities, powers that destroy in their attempts to order and delineate society, and the guests, the guests in their uniforms, are more than likely, almost all of us, those who go along with the way it is, those who go with the flow, listen to authority, obey it perhaps blindly, because the threat of destruction in one fashion or another looms large. And the one who is different, the one who is not wearing this world's uniform, is in fact the one who was bound hand and foot. The one who was cast not just into darkness, but the very outer darkness. The one who experienced all the weeping and gnashing of teeth. The one who was speechless before accusing authority. The one kicked out of this world's feast is none other than Jesus the Christ. And the kingdom of God as the parable begins, is not the king himself, or the war that the king wages on those disobedient to him, or the party with his uniformed guests. The kingdom of God is to stand up against this world's violence. The kingdom of God is created, even as we say no to powers that would take away our God-given human individuality as we reject the casual murder of everyone in the way of humanity's greed, when we are willing to risk standing alone and apart from the systematic violence of the world to take a stand for the oppressed and the lowly and the ones of no account, when we, like Jesus, will have no part in rivalries, vengeance, 
the prejudices and socially sanctioned hatreds of this world, then indeed we are building God's kingdom one precious stone at a time.